Right now, we're going to welcome Danny Gomez to the show for our Net Zero Carbon segment sponsored by Convoy. Danny, thank you for joining us. And today we're talking a little bit about how, even though the Biden administration has put a ton of emphasis on a transition to greener energy, diesel still ruling the transportation market, specifically in the truck space. So let's talk about that just a little bit. Hey, how are you guys doing? Sorry, and there's a little bit of an echo on my end. Um, but yeah, I wanted to touch base just to level set really and talk about what's happening across transportation and what's happening with regulation. Um, there's a lot of push, both from like a you know social pressure perspective on companies from um, from just you know their customers that feeds into capital markets that feeds into you know um, regulation and and politicians and how they react to what the public wants and there's just a groundswell of um, desire for people and companies to be more sustainable. And so how does that play out in transportation? So there's um, a push for people to um, adopt alternative fuels. So that's um, biofuels, that's electrofuels, fuels that have a lower um, emissions footprint and, and have lower emissions um, when, they're, when they're burned. And then there's also a push to use electric vehicles. And those things are both at the very early stages. Um, electric vehicles we're obviously seeing a lot in um, personal use. I'm, I'm sure we can all attest that we're seeing more Teslas and more um, EVs driving around in, on our blocks. And so that's beginning to take root there. And that makes a lot of sense um, for lighter and personal cars because of um, the, the ability to adapt to the range limitations. Um, that the batteries and the cars have at this point, as well as the charging infrastructure. It doesn't yet make a bunch of sense for long haul trucking because um, just the, the, bill, the range for the, um, for the batteries, um, the charging infrastructure, um, and just the, you know, the ability to implement that is costly. Um, and then on the alternative fuel side, that's more of an interesting story because um, what is developing right now is what they call drop-in fuels. So fuels that can replace diesel immediately and don't require um, investments in changing um, investments in the, in, in the trucks themselves. And so that to me seems like the low hanging fruit at the moment. And again, we talk a lot about some of the words that we use are transition fuels. What is a transition, transition fuel? It's a fuel that is going to be um, less emitted than um, traditional fuels, but isn't perfectly net zero, but it is putting us in the right direction. We know it's going to take a lot of time to make the gains that we need to see on complete zero emission vehicles. So in the meantime, let's not just throw in the towel and wait for that to happen. Let's make some steps to try to reduce emissions today. And so what the, what the market, I think, is signaling is that, look, it's going to take a while. We're still working through the the you know net zero or um, complete zero emissions perspective, but in the meantime, let's do what we can. And that, from a fuels perspective, that shows up in some of these alternative fuels. There's also a lot that's happening in regards to efficiency. And so, one of the things that, um, for example, Convoy talks a lot about is um, that we there's there's things that we're doing as an industry today that are super inefficient. Um, and empty miles is one of those things. And if we were to focus and be smarter about how we um, stitch our networks together and ensure that we're not driving empty miles, that we can reduce emissions, I believe the stat is um, above 20%. And so those are kind of the things that we're looking at here. And for um, you know the administration to be pushing for this um, is obviously key, but also for the industry to understand like what that means for them um, is important, and I think, for the things to not be at tension with one another, for them to be hopefully working in concert. So, uh, Danny, uh, welcome to the show, and thanks, thanks for that. And there's so many questions. You know, there's people that say that electric vehicles aren't the way that it's going to happen. You know, there's arguments against the battery. There's the drop in fuels, as, as you mentioned, et cetera. But I, I'd like to ask you your opinion, being a financial expert yourself, is, is how do we move forward with the expense of reducing these emissions on um, the smaller carriers since we're in transportation let's talk about carriers but there's there's other situations where it puts undue pressure uh, well maybe not undue pressure but it puts pressure on 
fair competition, let's put it that way. Does our drive towards zero emissions, I mean, it, it's complicated by that aspect, is it not? And what's the danger of losing competition as we move towards this with the cost barriers? Yeah, so it's a great question. The, the, the best setup is a market-driven approach, right? Right. I think we can all agree that that tends to, to incentivize people in the right ways. And so rather than showing up with a big stick, how, many, so how can we be handing out carrots? And so if we look to other industries, let's take solar, for example, um, there's, there's a desire for firms, big corporates, uh, medium-sized companies, any, anyone who really can um, can attest that they're using green power. There's a desire for them to do that, right? Whether it's mm -hmm. um, sure. their own corporate goals or they have local state goals um, that require for them to do that. But they say, hey, look, I want to use solar power. I want to use um, wind. Um, let's focus on solar for a second. And so if I have a solar plant and I'm part of a grid, for those who aren't familiar how the power grids work, they're generally regionally organized um, transmission systems. And when I produce um, a megawatt of solar power, I put it onto the grid and it gets mixed in with all the coal and the gas and the nukes and every other um, uh, megawatt that gets produced. There's no way for me to tag that specifically unless I have a direct line, say Michael T or um, distribution center. Right. Or industrial facility. Mm -hmm. And so what ends up happening is I say, okay, look, the system's gonna give me credit. They're gonna say, hey, Danny produced a megawatt of solar power and he can transfer that credit um, or that um, certificate to some would-be buyer. And it could be you. And you could say, hey, look, I want that one megawatt of solar. I say, okay, great, I'm gonna hand that to you. And so you have a way of saying, okay, well, I probably didn't get the one megawatt of solar. It's by a mixture of, of, of a bunch of gen uh, the generation, um, but I can I, I can show, I can uh, show proof that I, that I did purchase, right, that certificate. And there's a cost to that. It's traded separately from the actual energy um, that you consume. And so if we think about how that works in transportation, right now we have a very bilateral system where, Michael, you may say, hey, Danny, I want green, greener transportation. Um, I say, okay, great. Um, but it's really hard for me to invest in the part of the country that I service you in, right? But, you know, this other side of the country, I run routes for customers, and it is the EV infrastructure is better there. I have more access to alternative fuels. They don't really care about the environmental um, component at, 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 this, at this time, um, but I can, let's say, mint these environmental attributes, and I could then pass them on to you. So what the transportation system needs to do is to start thinking about how we decouple these green initiatives from the actual transportation move for the specific customer and start thinking about how we allow small carriers to say, hey, look, I'm going to make an investment because for that investment, I'm going to mint, so let's say the equivalent to a solar certificate or a green transportation certificate. And I can then sell that as an, a separate um, component to the services I provide. And the market will dictate how much they value that, right? If they say, hey, look, it's, you know, five cents a mile I'm willing to pay up for a um, greener transportation, that sends a signal. And people cannot start to think about, okay, for five cents more a mile, what type of investment should I be making in the assets that I run in trans for, for my fleet? And so I think that's where we need to go. Right now, we have a very bilateral market. We need to decouple the environment from environmental attributes that are getting produced by would-be kind of greener transportation alter um, solutions, or options, and then let there be a secondary market that tells everybody what do we value that at, right? Like, if we can have, if we can decouple those things, and we can create a fungible kind of uh, token, so to speak, um, that can be traded across the industry and can start to set, let people understand how they set price around emissions. Three Danny. points for getting fungible in there, my friend. <laughs> yeah. Danny, one of the stories that we're talking about today is the California Air Resources Board is now opening their grant program for companies who are at the point of sale. They are getting a discount for purchasing clean vehicles. It's $500,000 at the point of sale for companies purchasing these clean vehicles, which is a huge amount of money and a really great upfront way to cut that cost, especially for those smaller companies. Right.
But this money is coming out of a, both a public-private partnership with support from a clean transportation nonprofit group who is providing some of the funding. Can you just very quickly touch on the importance of that public-private partnership if we want to eventually hit the goals that the public sector, the government, is telling us that we need to hit? Yeah, I mean, um, we say this a lot, right? It's going to take um, partnerships is one of the things we talk a lot about in um, sustainability. And for those who are newer to sustainability, I think the reaction that we get a lot is, wow, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of cooperation and partnership that's going on in this space, um, dissimilar to what you may see in others in other initiatives, just because the problem is so important and people want to be kind of rowing in, uh, in the same direction and they can um, melt away some of the competitive fears and um, as it pertains to sustainability, they're willing to, to, to link arms with would-be competitors and, um, and move in the right direction. So partnerships are huge, public-private um, are, are interesting as well. I think what we need to understand from a kind of a subsidy perspective, I, what, what I'd like to say is, one is that, um, you know, Alternative fuels do need subsidies to help move them forward um, in, in, in a lot of cases. Um, and it's not to say that, I, I think in general, right, this would be a great, great conversation to have with John Kingston. You know, what subsidies are there out right now for traditional energy sources, right? It's not the case that um, traditional energy has no subsidies or tax incentives and that alternative fuels have all the subsidies and tax incentives. They're both being um, subsidized um, and have tax incentives. And so we need to understand what manipulation we're doing of the price um, and start to look at those things in a normalized way so we can think about what's really, you know, what's really the impact here. How do we, how do we assess both alternatives in a, in a, in a like for like scenario? Um, because I think right now there's just so much traditional historical momentum behind traditional fuels that it makes it hard one for new fuels to be adopted because of the, the infrastructure challenges. Um, but also that, you know, they, I think at times they do get an unfair shake to that um, people who are not as uh, big proponents worry that the subsidies are creating this false market signal. I think there's just a lot of false market signals out there. Um, and we need to kind of just be real about what those are. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Danny, for uh, that update today. I look forward to more conversation. Can keep talking about this forever. Mm -hmm. There's so many rabbit holes to go down and so many interesting angles that can be down there as far as, you know, a as well as solutions right. to, to the problems, right? All right, we're going to take one last quick break. We'll be right back in just a few minutes to wrap up our show.